is the Cold War. The Cold War is defined as a tense period from 1945 to 1992 in which the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, vied for superiority but never went directly to war. So it first must be said that after World War II, Great Britain was exhausted. It had been a great power, um, a naval power for centuries. Um, it had been one of the great powers during the concert of Europe. It had fought World War I from the beginning. It had fought World War II from the beginning and was already overextended before going into World War II. So by the end of World War II, it was done. It was done as a superpower. France itself had never really gained superpower status um, since its attempt at empire during Napo Napoleon's time in the 1800s. And as a result, it was never in the running. Um, so the winners of World War II that were left as the great superpowers were the U.S. and the USSR. There were three phases of, of the Cold War we're going to go over. The confrontation. So this is the period in which we um, saw ourselves moving um, closer and closer towards war with the Soviet Union. Um, the first one I would say 1948 is the Berlin blockade. Now, after World War II, um, as I mentioned, the U.S. and the USSR did not trust one another. And so neither was interested in giving much territory to the other. Um, as a result, Germany, the losers of World War II, again, just like the losers of World War I, um, Germany was a big question mark. What should they do with Germany? And at the end of the day, what they decided is that the four allies in World War II would divide um, uh, Germany into four parts. Okay, so you have a northern part, western part, um, southern part, and eastern part. Um, and the Soviet Union would get, be responsible for the eastern part, and all of the western states would be responsible for the other parts. Well, the problem with this is that the capital of Germany, Berlin, was located in the so Soviet Union's part in, East, in um, East Germany. And as a result, they were trying to decide, well, what do we do with the capital of Berlin? And just like they divided the rest of the country, they decided they would, in fact, divide Berlin right down the middle. And so Berlin was given a western side that would be run as a democratic side and an eastern side that would be run as a communist side supported by the Soviet Union. Well, pretty soon after all of this was determined, uh, decided, um, the western states attempted to bring goods um, across from the western portions of Germany into the western Berlin part. Okay? And so they tried to drive their trucks in, and the Soviet Union sealed off the borders. So here you have western Berlin stuck in the middle of a communist land, and now it's being cut off from any of the democratic um, regions of Germany. And the western allies responded by dropping um, goods via airlift, uh, airlift f uh, flights into Berlin and bringing um, goods um, to the democracy, democratic part of Western Germany. Um, so in 1948, the Soviet Union started with the Berlin blockade, blocking um, the Western states from being able to get to Berlin, and the Western states responded by doing the Berlin airlift. This is what I would say is the first step in the Cold War that was a clear confrontation. Um, two years later, um, the uh, U.S. and the Soviet Union found themselves interested in dealing with an issue in Korea. Now, as we mentioned, during World War II, Japan had expanded into Korea. At the end of, war, when, uh, at the end of World War II, when Japan lost, the Korean Peninsula was um, controlled by the Allies. They handled it the exact same way they did Germany. They divided Korea um, and so that the Soviet Union would get part and the U.S. or the al other allies would get the, the democratic states would get the other part. North Korea was a com went communist, went towards the Soviet Union side um, of its regime, and South Korea went democratic. It is still to this, and it's along the 38th parallel, it is still to this day divided along the 38th parallel, and North Korea is a communist regime, and South Korea is a democratic regime. So much of what we're talking about during the Cold War, um, has legacy has, the legacy of the Cold War still stretches into today. Um, the Korean conflict occurred when the North Korean side um, decided that, and backed and supported by the Soviet Union and China to a lesser extent, um, decided it wanted to move south and consolidate the entire Korean Peninsula. So here you see in the picture the trucks moving south into the South Korean um, portion of the peninsula. 
Well, the U.S. was very concerned about this, as they saw that this was in um, their their deepest concern at the time was the Soviet Union communism would spread into democ democratic, loving states. And as a result, they decided to put um, troops on the ground. The U.S. put troops on the ground in uh, Korea in order to uh, push the North Koreans back up to the, past the 38th parallel. The Korean conflict lasted three years and was considered largely successful um, in that uh, the U.S. was able to push the communists back into North Korea. That said, an armistice was signed um, at the end, really agreeing to the status quo. Um, uh, so there was no clear victory on either side. South Korea m remained um, a democratic state, and North Korea um, remained a communist state. And as I mentioned, still to, uh, still to this day, um, these are uh, how the states exist. Um, the next... Uh, the next um, uh, event we've already gone into in some details, but was the Cuban Missile Crisis. As I mentioned, this is a situation in which the Soviet Union um, decided to move nuclear weapons into Cuba off the coast of Florida, um, and the U.S. responded by um, issuing a public announcement um, stating that this is what had occurred and creating a naval quarantine blockade um, around Cuba um, so as to um, stop any forward movement. The Soviet Union responded in kind by trying to um, uh, break the blockade, push through the blockade, and the U.S. fired shots across their bow. Um, so in fact, did not hit the Soviet Union directly. But when I say that this is the peak of the confrontation occurred in October 1962, I mean that there were shots actually fired in the directions of the, so of, of the Soviet Union ships by U.S. naval ships. Um, in the, the Gulf of Mexico that could have resulted in a direct war. This was a period called brinkmanship in which both sides um, saw that they were escalating towards war and unfortunately in the nuclear age, potential nuclear war. And you start to see after this time we move into detente. A time of, a, of an easement. Now what's funny about this period is I'm describing it as a time of detente and yet I'm including the Vietnam War, one of the longest, um, most infamous wars in our history. We like to think of ourselves as victors of war and yet we very much did not win the Vietnam War. And our uh, U.S. boots on the ground um, were, they were in Vietnam for about 15 years. Um, so in 1962 you have a very similar situation to what happened in Korea. Vietnam was divided north communist, south non-communist. Um, the North Vietnamese tried to move the army, tried to move south and consolidate the entire Vietnamese peninsula, or sorry, Vin Vietnamese country, not peninsula. Um, and in doing so, um, actually gained a lot more victory um, against the south in part because there, were th there was also this um, non-state actor group, this insurgent group in the South called the Viet Cong. And whereas we um, put our boots on the ground in Vietnam to try to fight the North Vietnamese army, we were successful against the army. We're pretty good in conventional warfare. If you line up our army with another army, we most often win. The problem was this Viet Cong, this insurgent group that was more um, of almost like a today's terrorist group. Um, they were they used surprise tactics. They hid in the the jungles. They would be dressed as civilians, and when the U.S. Army would come into um, villages and attempt to make friends um, in the village, they would surprise them and attack them. Um, they moved through uh, the jungle quietly and stealthily, so they didn't roll tanks through uh, the jungle. In fact, our tanks proved completely ineffective in the jungles of Vietnam. Um, but instead, the Viet Cong relied on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a trail, um, a network of um, secret pathways that moved from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, um, sometimes even tunnels underground that would allow um, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong to coordinate and bring supplies down to the South so they can use against the, the, the U.S. Army. Um, this is why we stayed so long in Vietnam. And at the end of the war, we ended up, public opinion turned against this war, and we became um, very tired. And in the 1970s, Richard Nixon ran on the promise that he would get um, the U.S. out of Vietnam. Um, the U.S. decided the, uh, signed an armistice with the North Vietnamese and uh, pulled out of Vietnam. And pretty soon the North Vietnamese um, then launched an attack against the South Vietnamese and took over the entire, entire country.
um, and North uh, and Vietnam was considered a communist country and actually still nominally calls itself communist, though it practices very capitalistic um, uh, market economy. All right, the Chinese, the Sino, part of Sino-Soviet split. China was um, our friend during World War II, <laughs> if you were to pick sides. And then in, um, it was such a weak state. Um, it was our friends because Japan was our enemy, and Japan and China have long since been rivals in power for, for Asia. Um, China was our friend in 1945, so much so that FDR encouraged China to be a part of um, the United Nations and said, let's even give it a veto power on the Security Council because it will always be loyal to us. Um, well, that's super interesting considering now China is one of the powerhouses that we're competing against in the international system. Um, but during this time, so 1945, China was a friend of ours. Um, but pretty soon after, Mao, um, the communist, uh, or M Mao, the leader of China, decided that it was going to cozy up with the Soviet Union and choose and link its future to the Soviet Union rather than the United States. So much so that by 1948, it called itself a communist regime and was clearly allied with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Um, it was pretty clear that both practiced communism, but both saw things very differently. China practiced a more rural communist view, uh, believing that the peasants were the future of communism, whereas the Soviet Union practiced a more urban and industrialized view of communism. Um, second of all, one of the other issues about w between them was that Mao wanted to see China as the great communist power, not the second great communist power. And so you start to see that um, Mao starts bad-mouthing, for lack of a better word, um, the Soviet leadership uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s. And by the 1970s, you start to see that there's a real split between China and the Soviet Union. Um, a classic example is at the end of the Cuba, Cuba, Cuban Missile Crisis, when Khrushchev was ultimately viewed as losing the um, negotiations with Kennedy, agreeing to remove his, uh, his missiles from Cuba. Um, Mao came out and very strongly said that he failed as a leader, and that if Mao had been negotiating, this never would have happened, and very um, antagonistic and publicly so. Well, um, very smartly, the U.S. saw in that by the 1970s that China and the Soviet Union were really um, discordant, and as a result, decided the best way you handle two enemies that don't get along is you drive a wedge between them, like any good um, adolescent um, teen mo or teen movie would suggest. Um, you go and you make friends with um, your enemy's friend. And so you see at this time in the 1970s, Richard Nixon uh, was the first sitting president to visit China. And he went and he walked the Great Wall and he uh, waved at pan pandas and he um, opened up trade agreements with China. Um, you see at this time, then China became, became, started to become a trading partner for the United States. Um, and also started to think maybe a little capitalism in our lives doesn't hurt anything. Um, and this was interestingly, as I mentioned before, a time in which liberals started saying, hey, even during this Cold War, you start to see that it's not all about military conflict, but instead the U.S. is calling itself an enemy of China and yet going and visiting China and beginning to trade with China. And as I mentioned at the time, they also began trading with um, the Soviet Union during this time, though much more quietly. Um, you started also seeing that there was a bit of, um, of an exhaustion when it came to the arms race. Um, the, uh, both sides during the Cold War felt like they had to out-arm each other in order to truly compete with the other. There was high insecurity, a question of whether they would go to war. Um, and so when the U.S. detonated its nuclear weapons in 1945, you saw the Soviet Union attempt to de detonate its first weapon in 4048. Um, and as it got a better weapon system, you see them, uh, the Soviet Union responding in kind with an even better weapon system. Um, the space race during this time, one of us, uh, the uh, Soviet Union got to the moon, or sorry, got to space, and so we got to the moon. Um, well, in 19, the 1970s, you start to realize that there was a lot of economic exhaustion about this. More and more, both of these superpowers were attempting to be just that, superpowers, and yet they were moving, using more and more of their economic um, uh, trust, all of their money, to be spent on uh, guns versus butter, it's called, to be used more on armaments than on growing their economy. And both of them started to see that this was not great to, be, to maintain superpower status. You need to invest in your economy and grow your economy. 
And so during the 1970s, you also start to see them um, engage more and more in agreements with each other about arms, limiting arms, so that it wouldn't just get caught up in these arms races that would um, go on forever. Um, and so one of the best ones, pardon me, I know you can hear the chapel bell. I try to focus on me. Um, one of the uh, best agreements that they came to was called the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, or SALT, in which they said, whatever we do with nuclear weapons, let's go ahead and take the smaller weapons and attempt to sign a treaty so we won't just increase our stockpiles of them, but we'll actually leave them alone and even at a point start to try to decrease our stockpiles. So you start to see them making a steps towards each other um, and at least saying, let's uh, pause in the arms race right now. Well, it was after 1978 that you started to see them move towards rapprochement. Um, and uh, this was kind of uh, the Carter was not as vocal and antagonistic towards uh, Jimmy Carter was not as antagonistic towards the Soviet Union and you started to see more and more arms deals and, uh, and agreements about um, uh, the arms races occurred between the two states um, well then um, Ronald Reagan was elected president and in uh, Reagan shifted the focus a bit in his rhetoric whereas um, Carter was more of peaceful and attempting to be more reconciled uh, a, a tone of reconciliation Reagan went the opposite he called it rollback in which he determined that the only way to finally end the Cold War is to ramp up his um, aggressive uh, aggressive rhetoric um, he also, I think, intuited that the Soviet Union was at this time internally facing a lot of conflict. Communism, many say, is inherently flawed. Whatever, your agreement, whatever you believe, um, if you're a Marxist or if you believe that communism is the worst thing ever or you don't know about communism, one of the issues about communism in the Soviet Union was that if you have a state-run economy, if you have an economy that's telling people you don't have to start your own business, will instead tell you what your business will be, will tell you what you're going to um, do, and then the state will give you a salary. It doesn't matter if you do it well, doesn't matter if you do it poorly, you will still get paid. There is a bit of a flaw in that logic in that it doesn't encourage people to in, in, innovate, to come up with new ideas, to, um, to increase efficiency. There is a bit of um, a belief that the economic system can run on its own but doesn't necessarily encourage growth. So you have that internal logic. You also have the issue that if you increase, um, if you encourage everybody to do industrial urbanization, you don't have as many people growing and um, or diversifying your economy in other areas, and that's one of the criticisms of the Soviet Union. And then the third uh, belief of like, well, why was the Soviet Union not as strong as it uh, was in the 1980s and starting to see internal conflict? Um, a third reason was that it had been spending so much money on armaments and not on building an economy that it was starting starting to see um, major economic problems um, occurring. Well, um, Reagan may have intuited, intuited this, um, but Reagan launched what was called the Strategic Defense Initiative. Instead of saying, I'm going to stop building arms, in 1983, Reagan went in front of the American public and looked them in the eye on the nightly news and said, I am going to double down. I am going to create the world's most sophisticated defense system so that no nuclear attack from the Soviet Union can ever be possible to the United States. And what he said is he said he's going to um, determine uh, how to build a defense system that doesn't just wait for a nuclear weapon to fly through the air into the atmosphere and then blow it up, which is what the defense system really was at the time, but instead he's going to set up, as the image shows, these satellites that were able to shoot lasers at nuclear weapons in space and destroy them there so they will never possibly be able to come and hit the United States. Um, what's interesting about this is that there was no scientific evidence at the time to suggest that this was possible. To be honest, there's no, there's no scientific evidence currently that really shows that this is something that is achievable. Um, many criticized him immediately and called it Star Wars, said he'd been watching the Star Wars movies, which were out at the time, um, the original ones, and he said, this is, the, you know, this is science fiction, this is not real. But what was amazing at the time is whether or not Reagan believed 
that this was achievable or if this was just one of the best political bluffs in the uh, you know throughout the Cold War. The Soviet Union class declassified documents from the Soviet Union suggested that they got very worried and realized that they had in fact potentially lost the Cold War. That if the U.S. was serious, that they could no not they would not come close to being able to invest the money that was required to compete with this kind of defense initiative. In which case, many say that it was the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative of Reagan, that kind of signaled to the Soviet Union they had in fact they were losing the Cold War. Um, the clearest change for the Cold War came um, with the appointment of, of Mikhail Gorbachev as the leader of the Soviet Union. Um, whereas the other leaders, Khrushchev and others, and lesser known um, leaders, had been more of the old guard, um, very interested in communism, very rigid in their belief systems, Michel Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev um, was considered to be younger, much younger than any of the officials. Um, more cosmopolitan and more open to new ideas. He had um, studied abroad in Europe. Um, he knew multiple languages. His um, uh, his uh, wife was an an economist, and he had um, been around economists that had long since told him about the concerns of the internal economic issues of communism in the Soviet Union. And so when he came to uh, power, he really assumed that there must be strong reform. And he started intima um, uh, uh, intimating that there would be strong policy reforms. Um, and he started implementing them. And uh, this took place over several years. Um, and by the end, by the 1989, many believed that um, the end of the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union was, and as a result, the Cold War um, was near. Many believed that the Soviet Union could no longer exist as a large communist regime that it had. Um, and one of the biggest symbols of that was that um, in Berlin, a wall had been built with, uh, between the Western, Western Berlin Democratic play, um, side and the Eastern Berlin side, and nobody was allowed to cross those. Um, and in 1989, people just ordinary people started coming from Western um, uh, Berlin and Eastern Berlin, started knocking down the walls and then climbing over the walls and reuniting with um, cousins and family members that they hadn't seen in decades because they had not been allowed to cross the walls. And um, the Soviet Union let it happen. They let this wall um, come down and they let um, without any enforcement. Um, and many believe that this was the symbolic end of the Soviet Union and as a result, the end of the Cold War. Um, 1991 was the formal dissolution of the Soviet Union, and in 1992, many of the states that um, existed um, in uh, under the Soviet Union. So, as you see, all of this um, in the in the colored map, um, Russia w uh, became the largest um, state um, in the former Soviet Union, and then you see all of these other states were born out of this. Um, so, by 1992. Uh, many of these states um, chose to create constitutions and chose to create democratic regimes and to no longer be communist.